Oh, we don't have audio. Oh, <laughs> great. Okay, now we have audio. <laughs> We're so happy to be here for another Lunch and Learn. Happy December, everybody. It's the holiday season. It's just a really a beautiful day. And we're so happy to have Theo Wilson with us as our guest. Alicia, would you like to share a little bit about Theo? Hey, everybody. Um, welcome today. And Theo, thank you so much for saying yes to joining us today. Um, I know we we really started talking a little bit about this when we were at a event and Tommy Nuhulu had done some art and it was a live actionary kind of interaction kind of art. And Theo was one of, uh, I guess, the muses for that piece. Um, do you remember who was it? It was Richard. What's his last name, Theo, that we were the event? Do you remember? I don't remember. Wasn't it the one I read Red, at... Uh, Redline, Red yeah. Redline Art yeah. Gallery, yeah. Redline. yeah. You know what? I'm, I, I don't remember it. I was invited kind of at the last minute, okay. and so I didn't even know I was amused for the piece until I got there. <laughs> so yeah, that was wild. And, uh, and we were having dinner with uh, with Tommy this just a couple of nights ago, and he had mentioned he's like, I'm so excited we're gonna have Theo on the show. Tommy's also one of our board members. He's like, Do you remember I did this piece and I had Theo in there and. Um, yeah, it was a beautiful, beautiful piece. And uh, it was wonderful to spend some time. Huh? No, 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 no. Yeah, yeah. That was a, that was a great night. It was, a, it was a wonderful night. Yeah. And um, I was so excited when we started talking about the possibility of you joining us. Um, Theo, you, your, uh, your work has been inspirational on a whole lot of levels. It really has. And, um, you know, everything from your infiltration within, um, well, I'll let you talk about it a little bit later, but um, mm -hmm. the infiltration into white supremacy and the alt-right and you know extreme liberalism and all of these things, um, they're key. They're key for us to come together, for humanity to come together. And it's the key for all of this division that we have been experiencing. Um, so I just wanted to say hello to you this morning. I wanted to say thank you so much for joining us um, it's always good to see you, and um, and I always love seeing you and your beautiful family. The photos of your beautiful family, um, blessings, blessings on your your children. Yeah, your wife and your children. All right, Myrna. Um, because we are having some tech issues today, I am going to back out. Maybe one less uh, less drain <laughs> on um, on technology, and um, and I can certainly jump in at the tail end if if it Great. seems. It's a good time too. Thank you right. so much, Alicia. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you both. So Theo is a civil rights activist. He's a human rights activist. He is a leader in the black community. He's an artist having it being a slam poetry um, national winner, I believe. Um, he's also the star of a show on the history channel called I was there. Um, that show that's been playing and um, has done three TED talks, right? Three. Um, a little more than that, but I'm I'm okay. gonna I'm gonna be humble and just say three. So I'd love for you to introduce yourself, kind of before we dive in, just maybe add to that and introduce yourself so people can know more about you. Thank you so much, Myrna. Um, essentially, I'm just trying to help, and that's all it really boils down to. When I start in my own backyard, which is the black community, and in that almost every intersection of activism you can find in that backyard, um, black community, my backyard. And from there, I've been able to lend my voice to a whole lot of issues that I didn't anticipate lending it to when I first started down this path. Uh, and so I'll just say that I meet a lot of nice people and the people who are not so nice, uh, I understand what they're trying to do. And with that understanding, comes a lot of keys to some doors that we've been challenged with in our culture. And I'm ha I, I happily share those keys, but whether it's arts, you know, spoken word and slam poetry or the Ted talks or shop talk live, my organization, 
it's all about connecting folks. And that's what I'm doing here. That's great. Thank you so much. No yeah, there's, there's several paths that we can go down today. Um, yeah. So that's really um, awesome. And you may have already answered this, but I'll go ahead and ask it. What's the common thread among all of those different roles that you have right now? The common thread and underlying most important purpose for you? Probably it is dismantling structural violence. It simply does not need to be. And those who benefit from that violence only do so in the short term. In the long term, uh, in a universe, what you do to one other, you do to yourself. And so uh, systems of privilege are artificial paradises. And they are propping up people in a way that actually in their privilege uh, stunts their growth as people. And so I just figured that what's important is dismantling those systems of privilege because that's the thing that all of these things have in common. And seeing if we can find a replacement for them that looks like a thriving and harmonious world and that yeah, we can all yeah. belong to. And I think that's the vision that we're building towards versus just the systems that we're fighting against. Right, that's beautiful, building a parallel society or par parallel mm -hmm. structures that people can shift toward as they turn away from dysfunctional structures and systemic problems. Right. Yeah, yeah. You mentioned um, that that privilege is an artificial um, paradise, right? Mm -hmm. I, that's very intriguing to me. Um, you're saying that people with privilege, which a, a lot of people have, I feel like I have a certain extent of what white privilege, right? Um, As that do I. privilege, yeah. what you're saying is, what you're saying is that it's not actually a truth, right? Like if you dial, drill down, it's not a truth. Right. I mean, when you look at it, uh, now we're starting to find that every time you hold down a entire group of people, you're just wasting human potential, ultimately, right? Um, I've heard a Muslim cleric say that a, a, a nation can rise no higher than its women. Well, let's take that example of a false privilege, a male privilege. Uh, when you're wasting the intellectual capital of half your populace because they have a double X chromosome or are born into a femme expressing uh, gender, what you're doing is you're saying, um, where we are is fine. There's no way we could ascend, rise above or overcome any challenges and we don't need their help doing that as arrogance. And, and, we, um, and that, are you implying that there's there's nothing that needs to be improved? Right, right, right. If you think that, for example, some of the greatest scientists that America could have produced didn't end up hanging from southern trees in the era of Jim Crow, then what you're saying is that you think that all alone, the dominant class just has it under wraps. They've got it under control and that there's nothing they needed to learn. We know that that's false. Some of the greatest inventors uh, did so without any education and a whip to their back. You know what I mean? And so yeah. I feel like we are all impoverished when we accept this man-made privilege, this structural uh, benefit on the quote, winning end of violence, when what we could do is dismantle it and find so much more treasure on the other side. Mm -hmm. And what you gotta do is actually overcome your fear of quote, losing in an artificial zero sum game anyway, that doesn't need to be. We have literally out engineered zero sum games. And that's what I'm trying to get folks to see. Say more about that, because I think that's a really important point that it's not a zero sum game. It, we, we can all be winners in this situation, right? There don't have to be winners and losers. We really can be, you, you know, like as somebody who, uh, I, I come from what I call a warrior family, right? Uh, the men in my family have known war of different kinds, whether it's directly serving for our country or somewhere in the street or even in martial arts. Uh, what, what I find is that, so there was a time for that. I fully understand in the intellectual exercise how it seemed like, well, my tribe didn't have enough and your tribe has too much and we're going to take because my kids need to eat. I get that, right? That totally makes sense. Uh, what, a thousand years ago, even up to 100 years ago. But what people don't understand is that the very technology of war out evolved it. The very things that we did to take from others, we can now engineer these things for ourselves. We used to need land, take land by all means. is the one thing God ain't making no more of until we invented aeroponic farming. 
right? Until we could like literally grow food in vertical artificial towers, right? Until we could, you know what I mean? Like, I, I get it. We had a petrol driven economy for the last 200 years from the industrial revolution. Well, we've out engineered that. We literally don't need this anymore, but we have a culture that's based around competition, mm -hmm. violence. Uh, we have a culture that's based around a zero sum game, a zero sum mentality. And you actually cannot dismantle any of the isms and get the buy-in from those who benefit from the isms before you make them realize that the zero sum game is actually false and then demonstrate another way. So when you mentioned the agriculture industry and mm -hmm. um, how food is grown, part of what you're saying is there is enough for everyone. Right. Uh, right? We've, uh, what was that? The World Health Organization, I forget which global organization that there was. It said basically, even as we cross 8 billion people, there is enough food on the planet for everybody and a half right now, right mm -hmm. now. Yeah. And um, the, the problem is food waste and maldistribution. But it's not yeah. that there's not enough. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, and so we can go into how overpopulation is only a problem if 8 billion people are consumers. But when you talk about needing every hand possible on deck to re-green this planet, 8 billion people ain't enough. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you, so, can, you can flip it. You can flip it the other way. You can flip it the, the, the other way. But uh, the first thing it takes is a change in perception and a reassessing of the data points to include all of us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One thing I've always loved about your work is that you are a civil rights activist for the Black community. And that's, as you said, that's your backyard, right? This is what you know the best, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, but you actually do translate that so well into human rights. You don't, of course, just care about black people. You know, you understand yeah. that yeah. everyone is has value and that um, I, I love that about your work. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, so the concept is be one black first. And the reason why we did that is because the umbrella of minority does not encompass every person in that category, every group in that category the same. There are specific needs of the black community, the descendants of the enslaved Africans who were brought over here in chains, right? We have specific needs. We have specific cultural traumas. We have specific ways in which the systems of privilege and supremacy affect us directly. And so what we found is that after the civil rights movement, there were certain things that were still not being addressed, right? And so what we decided to do is focus on those for ourselves and we have to do for self. We have to very be very focused in that. And then when you begin the doing, and then when you begin the work, you realize there's all these threads that are tied to other things that land in the black community. But when you pluck that thread, it goes to this community and that community and that community. And I actually don't even really have to leave the work I'm doing in the black community to affect these other communities with my work, right? And so, and I, and, just to care only about one's own is to deny the reality that like we all share this planet and like if an asteroid hits we all in trouble and in times of disaster you will see quickly how much we need each other regardless of what we look like and so i take care of la casa i, I, I take care of my backyard i take care of home but in, in the meantime I, I care about how it affects your home too you know what i mean yeah, that's great. Yeah. As you know, one of my things is that I look back at the planet from space and with the publication that I that I own about. And, and that's the most profound thing is that there's no national boundaries. You don't see the state lines or the country lines. They're not there. Right? They're, right. And we're all we are absolutely all here together on this together. Um, you know, you and I've talked a little bit about um white privilege or privilege of other people of, you know, all kinds of people like there's, there's, this occurs in all kinds of sectors of humanity. And right. what's interesting to me is how most of the time it's unconscious, mm -hmm. right? It's something that we are not aware of until right. something happens or we have a certain friend or a conversation. And it's really important that these things become conscious, that we become aware. Um, and there is really, truly, I, I, I really agree with you that you know, it's been really enlightening um, in the past year or so to even a couple years, I would say, because 
this is one of the good things maybe that came out of, of Black Lives Matter was that people are people are realizing that that this exists, right? right. And right. and what was really profound, I was at an event with Francoise, who does My Skin Global. She's against bleaching of the skin. She was a guest on our show last month. Um, and I was at a, a, a workshop that she held and I, it was very eye opening for me. Mm-hmm. It was full of mostly black people who are concerned about this issue. And I learned how they grew up and how different it was from how I grew up in mm-hmm. that even some nursery rhymes were mm-hmm. derogatory toward their own race. Yeah. Yeah. And the, it was very, very enlightening for me. And it made me realize the extent to which, you know, it is more difficult um, it's just an inherent thing in our society. Yeah. And, you know, when we talk about the, assum- the assumptions that drive our biases, right? All privilege is, really, is a positive assumption about your capabilities or value, right? But then when you span it out to the macro, it becomes mechanized, you see? And one of the things that, like, we struggle with in our community was, is, is is not past tense at all, is colorism, right? Colorism is the advent of what happened when uh, via the mechanism of rape, different shades of skin began to appear in enslaved folks and their descendants. And this is actually across the entire diaspora and places of colonization and hierarchy. You will see this. Haiti has its own version. Brazil has its own version. South Africa has its own version, right? But there's a hierarchy of light to dark, light to dark. And the darker brother is always at the bottom. So why wouldn't somebody raise in a caste system that was enforced by violence, by the way, not want to express traits that were closer to the ones who were doing the violence, who were doing the colonization, right? Who were doing the enslavement. And so we then internalized that bigotry against ourselves. And so a lot of what you hear in the population, uh, in the popular culture right now, you know what I'm saying? Black girl magic, my melanin is popping, you know what I'm saying? Proud of this natural hair, girl, keep it nappy, you know what I mean? All of that is us trying to basically bring the unconscious conscious Within the and black say community, to ourselves, even within within the black community, within the black community, right, yeah. right. So you know, what I'm saying like the actress Lupita Nyong'o talks about her journey being uh, even a dark skinned woman for where she came from, which is Kenya, right? You know what I mean? So it's like, and how to love that and see the beauty in that, and so unpacking Eurocentric beauty standards wasn't something that was originally conscious to us, right? We just that's who was making the images when you look at ads from the 40s and 50s and 60s, they just put the blonde bombshell up there. And the blonde bombshell was what even brunette white women wanted to be. You see what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. And so all of that is something that is now coming to the surface. The unconscious is being made conscious. And even the way in which black men talk about the women that they prefer in our community, right? I was like, you know, I like a light-skinned girl. I was like, well, why do you only like light-skinned girls, bro? You know what I mean? Like, how come that's only your pick? Yeah, is that you all know? that matters, really? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, but you're, trust me. There's, there's brothers who are like, yeah, that's, that, that, that's my qualification. You got to look like Beyonce or lighter, you know what I mean? We used to have a paper bag test that was enforced where you couldn't even attend certain black churches unless you were lighted in the paper bag. They literally put a paper bag up against your skin. And if you was too dark, you couldn't even come to that church or be in a black church. social club. This is church. Yep. Even in church. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. we're unpacking that and realizing that these are erroneous concepts, that there's beauty in all of our shades and that we're going to be conscious about expressing that. So yeah, all kind of stuff is going on. That's great. I don't want to lose the opportunity to have you share um, what you're probably m- most well known for, which was uh, as a black man infiltrating the alt right online. Um, it's a powerful story. I know you did your 2017 TED talk about this, and that went viral. Mm-hmm. And then you were interviewed on all the shows. And but I, what I I'd love to hear about that from you. Why did you do it? That's an important piece. And then what did you learn? Um, and because that's an epic learning for all of us. 
Thank you. All right. So, you know, let's take you back in time. 2015 is when I first went viral on my organic Facebook page, a video about reparations for black people. Mm -hmm. The first 10 minutes of the video, the, 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 no, there's only 10 minutes. The first minute of the video, I acted like I wasn't for it just to bring people in who wasn't for it. And then slowly I began to show actually there's a lot of merit actually to black people getting reparations. Slavery wasn't just a hundred years ago. You know, it was like much more recent as it evolved forms. That went viral, began to attract trolls. And these trolls were saying things that were literally outside of the matrix of reality to me, right? Keep in mind, this was 2015. The Donald Trump candidacy was gathering steam. Hillary seemed to be the choice, but Obama was still president. And so all my videos, as they began to go viral, because I wasn't the only one, I began to get in these pissing contests with these white supremacists. And I've, I've you know, and I, I would I would lock swords with these guys, like for real, for real. And I'm still not beyond that. I really wish I, I was, but if I'm feeling froggy, I might just <laughs> engage in a battle. Sometimes I'm feeling froggy, right? But not to the not to the extent that I did back then. Because back then I would go fully toxic and it wasn't working. It just wasn't working. I wasn't changing minds. I wasn't opening hearts. I wasn't doing nothing. <laughs> and so I began to wonder where is this coming from? We did not know about digital bubbles back then. Mm -hmm. Nobody was talking about echo chambers, yeah. target marketing algorithms, nothing. But we were definitely subject to them. And around that time, a friend of mine named Quincy Hines, who worked at an advertising agency, told me about how this worked. At the same time, I started learning about white supremacists making fake accounts on black Twitter. So I was like, OK, I'm <laughs> let's see how this works. And I created the account and I began to act in my fake persona and speak in my fake persona the ways in which I was being spoken to on my organic Facebook page because everything I was talking about was black lives, black lives, ending police brutality, creating structures of accountability and what black people need to do to unify. That was my page. It would get trolled and I could damn near copy paste what the troll said into my fake profile. Mm -hmm. And I watched it get applauded. I watched it get uh, celebrated. And I realized not only that people lose their way with social reinforcement, but looking at that social reinforced echo chamber, I saw how big the Trump movement really was. And I began to see that his presidency was more than just a long shot, that it was likely. And about eight months in, I realized I learned all I could learn from it. And I shut it down without thinking that I was ever gonna talk about it. I thought it was a silly experiment in how to drive myself crazy. And um, yeah, about, I'm gonna say a year after it was shut down, the curator for TEDx Mile High, Jeremy Duhon, saw me on the cover of Westward Magazine and I had done several poems before, but he asked me what I wanna do a speech, like a full length speech at TEDx Mile High. And I've submitted the script about what I was hoping to talk about, which was uh, quantum computing. And I had one line in there about going undercover in the alt right, just one, I, I really thought it was stupid. And they were like, excuse me, <laughs> what did you do? And I was like, oh, I just made a fake profile as white supremacist and learned all this stuff. It's like, uh, can you expand on that? And I was like, yeah. Anyway, talk comes out the same weekend that Charlottesville happened. Mm. Viral. And uh, yeah, I didn't tell people in the talk that I ended up in therapy over that. Lost two relationships over that. And that I was uh, suffering from some really heavy trauma. Uh, but yeah, I've been talking for a while. What was the second question you asked me? Uh, well, why you did it in the first place and then also uh -huh. what you learned from it? Uh, well, what I learned. Yeah. Essentially, to boil it down, there was two types of white supremacist trolls. They were in different places in the radicalization. One guy was the absolute toxic, perhaps violent actor who was hyperbolically saying provocative things. That guy's too far gone, right? for what I was kind of seeing what would work, which was relational de-radicalization. Then there was the other guy who was confused about why we were saying Black Lives Matter. The other guy was raised in the American school system, which taught history poorly. The other guy, he saw Barack Obama as president and had 
every reason in his mind to think that racism was over. Why y'all talking about it? Right? He's seen gangster rap videos. He's seen uh, all these po police stories about black men committing crime and wondered why y'all ain't focused on Chicago. Why are you talking about these police? Right? And this guy was saying, I'd love to wake up with Oprah Winfrey or LeBron James's bank account. Tell me why I have to say black lives matter. All lives matter. How come you can say black and proud, but I can't say white and proud, right? That guy, that guy, before the other gentleman gets to him, is actually worth a conversation and relational building de-radicalization exercise. You have to be able to sense the honesty. You have to be able to be present enough in your own being to sift past the triggering programming that's spewing out of his mouth. But if you can do that, you just might stop a mass shooter. You just might stop the next Timothy McVeigh. You never know. And that's what that talk was about. And you did. You engaged a lot of people like that, right? Yep. And uh, I remember yep. one of the things that came really from that was sort of a, an understanding, certainly correct me if I'm wrong, an understanding of maybe in a way how they got there, right? A lack of exposure, a lack of exposure to diversity and black people. And, you know, so you were starting to understand that, which created compassion, right? Maybe, right, maybe, right. maybe not endearment, <laughs> but at well, least- no endearment going on. Right, no. right, right. But at least I sense that, oh, wow, I could see how they got there. Right, uh, none of us chose our mama, none of us, right? Not that I can remember. Uh, and so I didn't choose the color I was born as, nor did you or any other guys who was in the alt right, right? I could see that with that accident of birth and the data points that they're gathering from the American environment, which is intentionally ahistorical, intentionally anti black, intentionally the land of forgetting, I call this place, right? But with the data points they gathered from their environment, I don't know how I would have come to any other conclusion had I been born on their side of the racial divide. I don't. Right. So this right. is more of a critique about, number one, the educational system, number two, our news culture, and I suppose, three, um, the fallout for us never undergoing what Germany did, an intentional denazification of our consciousness, an intentional deprogramming of our racism with the universal understanding that it's bad, right? You don't see nobody in Germany talking about, we need to keep up these statues of, of Himmler or Goebbels or Hitler because this is history. And these statues, you know, they're a part of our heritage. You don't see none of that going on in Germany. You see that going on in the South. Mm -hmm. You see that going on in New York with Columbus Square, right? Yeah. So these are the things that haven't happened to America that if they did happen to America, we could find some new problems to get caught up in and not these old ones that we've been fighting since my granddaddy was, you know, my age, right? Yeah. So yeah. that's what I think needs to happen. But we're of course willfully stubborn in holding on to these isms that we think allow us to win. And, and, that's and, the it's, and you're talking about these systemic problems too, right? It's not, mm -hmm. it's, right. it's not easy to solve. Look, I'm trying to stay out of the sun. <laughs> No, 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 no. It's, it's all good. <laughs> Look nice either way. It's all good. Uh, that's funny. Um, but but one of your points is that we're all inherently limited. I, I really think it's important to remember that we're all inherently yeah. limited by our lack of like life experience. You know, sure. you they always say to have empathy, walk in someone else's shoes. I can't walk in your shoes, Theo, right? And you can't walk in mine. There's no way for you to know what my life is really like or vice versa, right? So that's why it's so important um, to, but we have to consider it, consider it. And then um, the lack of exposure to different people is, is part of the problem. I love right. the idea that, I just love the idea that, and I really believe this, that different is good. You know, mm -hmm. different people, diversity is, is an inherently good thing, you know, yeah. It brings in different talents, different skill sets. You know, as you know, my son is an autistic uh, teenager and, you know, it's a good thing. It's actually a good thing. It's really uh, important for people to think about that. Right. Diversity is what nature does. In fact, non-diverse populations are wiped out. Like that's right. actually like how, like, 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 like nature does diversity, right? Diversity is a marker of resilience in all natural systems. 
And so when you talk about diversity and perspectives, um, the companies, for example, even in raw, brutal capitalism, companies that can bring diverse perspectives even into the marketing department see a higher return in their fourth quarter earnings. Mm. That's what they care about, right? So it's it, one of the things that I'm concerned about is making power understand its self-interest in these values. I've come to the hard conclusion that right and wrong don't cut it. Not with power. They don't care. Yeah, it's care wrong to burn profit, down the rainforest. I don't care. <laughs> like, I got to make this money, right? Well, in the rainforest, there could be a profitable cure for cancer. That's the line. That's the hook, right? Well, then let's see what we can do to preserve it. You're more likely to get a response from power when you engage in self-interest in that power. And I think that's what a lot of the activists miss. And that's what I think, uh, I had a weird, I suppose I can go into this personal part of my journey, uh, inculcation and initiation into different levels of warriorship. And one of those was sales, like raw, cold, capitalistic sales. I sold steel buildings and gym memberships. Like, this is how I had to make my money. Yeah. I had to be a good talker and I'd, I'd make that talk turn into money, right? And we had to study everybody from, you know, Tony Robbins to Brian Tracy and Les, you know, uh, Les Brown, all these guys who are motivational sales folks. And I learned some pretty strong universals in there. And I was in a high pressure environment and so they had to stick. But that's one of the things that I learned. You you really can't appeal to power with right and wrong. There's got to be self-interested. And once we understand that, then I think we'll be more effective as activists. That is a really important point. I'm totally taking this in because, um, you know, I'm a consultant for ethical AI. And, mm -hmm. and one of the biggest hurdles we have is that Literally, startups that are doing AI do not believe they can be profitable if they're ethical. It is a belief. <laughs> That's a tell, ain't it? Right? Damn. It's a belief. And so, obviously, we're kind of beating our heads up against the wall. So, your point is really well taken, right? That we turn that into, you you know, show them, show them with, with them, quantify it, right? right. How right. they can be. Um, and it's much more complicated than that, as you know. But and you oh, yeah. love this you love this topic as well, right? Yeah, I mean Yeah, let's I mean, ha, see look, you talking to me, I, I can go very deep into that topic if you if you want me to, but um Well, it's important. What I'll say is that Yeah, I was going to say you could tie it back to obviously um, you know, social media and how mm -hmm. unethical it is, um, you know, to they've they've been targeting undecided voters, for example, and then controlling what's on their feed, you know, and as you know, this creates that echo chamber you were talking about earlier, um, you know, so yeah, whatever, however you'd like to talk about that. Right. It seems like uh, in 2016, they did it to favor the right. And in 2020, they did it to favor the left. If I were to boil it down, but with, with, with 2016, that was the Cambridge Analytica situation where they were literally targeting people uh, and more often than not, drip feeding the right wing ideals, right? And it seemed like, I believe Google, I'm not quite certain of that, don't quote me, did something similar to that in 2020 uh, to make folks favor Biden. And so I think what's interesting about that is that this is symptomatic of a greater problem. And the problem is the corporate fascist state we live in. And a lot of people do not fully understand the ramifications of corporate fascism. We don't have a tool against it yet, right? When we talk about political fascism, right, the tool against that generally was war. So whether it was Mussolini or Adolf Hitler or Mao Zedong, some kind of warfare generally uproots the fascism that has a charismatic dictator controlling the state. What happens when the control of government levers is in the hands of a bundle of corporations exactly. it's a that we all buy from, that we actually can't live without anymore. Well, now things get weird because the masters of these corporations, the oligarchs or Plutarchs of this society, 
they can slowly erode the government barrier uh, barring their influence. And they've done that for the last 50 years. And so now, you know, Citizens United in- and before, right, they're buying influence and money is speech in a political system whereby the government is supposed to be the people's and not the profiteers. Well, here's the problem. Government actually is the only answer to this, but government in the hands of the people. So a lot of times I hear on the right, like people are tired of government, government too big, government too invasive. And I'm saying what you're feeling is not government per se. What you're feeling is government is the glove. The corporation is the hand. You see, we talk about corporations being too invasive. What they're doing is they're appropriating politicians to pass legislation. They're buying them, by the way. They're, they're bribing them. This is a little bribery, Absolutely. right? Right, right. The, these folks are literally with money because capitalism in its most mutated form is the corporatism we're talking about. They're buying influence with our elected officials to pass legislation that enables them further. And then with that, the government hand does certain things the government ain't supposed to do. And then people hate government. So they vote for smaller government. That's the plan, kid. That's what they're trying to do. But the fact is, government is the answer. But you got to be in the one in, in control and get the corporate hand out of the government glove and put the people hand back in it. That's a great That's analogy. the simplification of it. Huh? I love that analogy. It's a great analogy of the glove and the hand. And that right. the government is the, is the glove you. and they're not the ones controlling it even, right? And, um, but there's, yeah, corruption. I want to be clear too, that corruption is on all sides and this is not at all about left, right, Democrat, Republican. So We're it, talking about so a it, bigger picture problem. It is problem. everybody. A- you, you, you know, I, uh, my, my, my wife is from Africa. And so that means half my family is African. And I hear them talk about corruption in Africa. I hear them talk about, you know, how they be stealing aid you know what I mean? In, in 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 Africa, and there's these these buzzards, these vultures that leech off the the, the the people. And I said that ain't no different than what's going on here. It's just happening at a higher level. The difference between African corruption and American corruption is in Africa they break the law. In America, they change it. That's oh it. Oh my gosh, so well put. That's it. That's the only difference between African corruption and just like in Africa, where they say that the top buzzards, the rich suck up all the aid. That happens here too. What do you think 2008 bailout was? All the aid, come on, that was voted against by the people across party lines against the margin of 100 to 1. The people did not want that bailout. They knew that was taxpayer money. They knew that the corporations had messed up and by the laws of capitalism, you're supposed to go under, right? Yeah. But they had already sucked it up and the aid went to the wealthy just like it does in Africa. Yeah. And just to break that down a little further, what you're saying is, you know, the our Federal Reserve, you know, they say printed money. Of course, it's not really printing it anymore, but yeah, they're yep. creating it out of thin air is what they're saying, because it's not on the gold standard and it's they're creating it out of thin air. But all of that, most of that money in 28, 2008 did go to corporations and not to help the people who lost their homes. Right. In the in the whole housing crash. Um, that that movie, The Big Short, is uh, highly recommended to, if you want to know, you know for, for the people who want to know more about that. But that's so, you're right. And so I think sometimes we talk about these things theoretically. We say that, like, what's the bottom line? Those people who lost their homes were not helped. Not only that, but I'm going to call that as the most strategic failure of the Barack Obama administration. Because the bell happened on Bush's watch. Let's be clear. Right. It was a Democrat that started the ball in motion, right? Clinton leaves office, 2000. One of the last things he does is repeals the Glass-Steagall Act, which set up a wall for corporations being able to gamble with the people's pensions, deregulates the market, right? Now, what a lot of people don't know is that those toxic mortgages, those refinance loans, those subprime loans were being practiced in black communities in the 90s. Yep. Black communities were, by the time the year 2000 rolled around, half of the refinance loans in the black community were subprime. Those predatory lenders were practicing in the hood, right? As- Devaluing black homes, but there was no oversight over there. When Clinton deregulates the market, they had already practiced their craft. 
and repackaged these loans to white people as option arms, adjustable rate mortgages, right? And so for eight years, it runs rampant under Bush. But Bush also does the war. The war in Iraq drains all of the spare capital, right? The thing hits the fan under Bush's watch. Obama, you at one job, dude. Obama, you at one job. Honor the poor like we voted for you to do. The whole symbolism behind your black presidency was that you come from the bottom. I'm the son of a Kenyan goat herder and a white lady from Kansas. That's great. Bruh, the assumption in that is that you care about the little guy. That's the, uh, the assumption. When Obama does not put a single banker in jail, when he doesn't bail out from the bottom, what he should have done is buy up all the mortgages so that the people could stay in their homes. This is what you do with that money. It's the people's money. Exactly. Well, now you open the door for Donald J. Trump to come in with a fake ass populism. That's what you did with that. Because Rust Belt White America just wanted somebody to ride for them. They wanted somebody to protect them. They deserved it. They were disadvantaged and taken advantage of by the wealthy, by Wall Street. All you had to do, Obama, is buy up their mortgages from the bottom let the top fall. We know we could have let that happen now because when COVID came, we saw how bad stuff could really get. We could have let the big banks fall. Yes, we could have. You look at all the shuttering of the doors that happened under COVID and all the lockdowns, all the big, we could have let them fall. We know that now, right? But that opens the door for everybody to come in on the right who had that toxic kind of uh, um, populism and who could blame them? Low key, who could blame them? And I'm a fan of Obama the guy. But that was a strategic error, period. Yeah, yeah. And the same thing happened with COVID with the bailouts, right? Let's go. <laughs> it, the, the phrase transfer of wealth was in the media everywhere, but no one ever said that it's actually a horrible thing. And it was transferring the wealth of the average Americans into the pockets of the wealthy. If you use Amazon alone as an example, right? Everybody's Fish. having everything delivered straight to their house and and, you know, it's it's the wealthy getting wealthier is what's been happening as as happened in 2008. Right. There were two transfer of wealth stories happening simultaneously, and they used one to cover the other. The cover story of the transfer of wealth was the fact that the baby boomers are getting old now and that they're giving their money. They're giving their wealth to the next generation. So that was a cover story. The largest transfer of wealth in history is happening from the boomers to the millennials, right? That was a cover story. But what you're talking about, Marina, is the true story. And the true story is the fact that small business, which is the only real competition to the corporatocracy, took the biggest possible hit. That the net worth of the richest men in the world doubled in a few months, that's a hustle for you. That is, that is bank, what you talking about? Who wouldn't want their net worth to double in nine months, right? So all of these people, right? And so this is one more feat of the corporatocracy, right? Because I'm sitting here, I'm too connected to the black community to have been in favor of the bailouts. I knew it was gonna happen. And what I thought was gonna happen, happened, right? Mm -hmm. Forbes magazine reports 41% of black businesses shutter yeah. in the lockdowns, 41%. If you lose 41% of your blood, you're dead, right? 41% of the black businesses in this country shudder. Not only that, but you have a situation where crime spikes because a lot of crime is just young people without direction and a whole lot of trauma. And I knew that when the lockdowns came and these boys on the block didn't have no place to go, they couldn't tell their homies, hey bro, can't join y'all today, you know what I'm saying? Gotta be at the J-O-B, right? They need that. Yeah. Can't join y'all today, man. They got some going to the Boys and Girls Club. My mom making me go. You understand how it is. Even if, even if it's a lie, you need an excuse. Well, when the lockdown comes, there's no lie. There, there, there's no job. You can't tell the homies nothing. And the young people who was low-hanging fruit to the hood got sucked in. The rest is history playing out right now. So, yeah, the Democrats enabled that. If you don't mind, The way they that treated the people. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. I was going to say, we take that a bit further. I don't know what happened then to those kids who didn't have a job to go to. And then, I mean, I know it's a negative thing. What, what happened to them? A lot of them died. A lot of them got incarcerated for committing crimes. 
they yeah they just didn't have structure to stay out of trouble kind of thing not not only that but they was often locked at home with their abusers so when the school closed oh, yeah, and this yeah. is what something you know I, I got friends who are teachers in denver's far north northeast they was getting calls with the pandemic like yo my dad is not only home all the time but he touching me and he drinking hella because he's depressed right this is what yeah. the kids are telling him so yeah when the democrats the left i hate to say it because i was a part of them decided that they needed to sacrifice people business and connection to try to stop the virus which we know now was an ineffective strategy and we could have told you that back then we are gonna be in this garbage for a long time because of their actions and that's what a lot of people are doing and it just enabled the transfer of wealth it just enabled it in the and wrong that's direction what happens, <laughs> right in that's what happens direction. when government yeah. is in the hands of corporations yeah 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 um thank you wow um we have about six minutes left um we mm -hmm. might go a few minutes over we'll see since we started a few minutes late but we do have yeah. one question for you now um and what would you do differently with your infiltration of the far right what would you do differently i wouldn't do it at all no more that's crazy mm -hmm. i've not done it I I wouldn't have done it like even and I'm and I'm glad that a lot of good came from it. But uh, what I would do differently was what I would do differently was have mental health access uh, while I was doing the experiment. Oh, yeah. I would yeah, have yeah. been in the hands mm -hmm. of a, a therapist at the very time. The reason why it was not wise for me to do that is because I'm a police brutality survivor. And a lot of the wounds got reopened during that time. Wow. And 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 I was in such a dark place. Like I was it, like to my girlfriend at the time, I was insufferable. I was insufferably combative. Mm. And that dissolved. And then some other stuff happened with the following relationship. And that fell apart. So I would have been in the hands of a of a trained professional. <laughs> <laughs> before I ever did something like that ever again. And that's, yeah, that's why when people really, ask me about it, I don't recommend it. That's a big warning. That's a really big, important warning. Um, you know, your point is about your own mental health going through all that. And it's the same point of what people were going through with the lockdowns. You know, there's so much mental health um, problems because of the extreme reaction of the government to what was happening. And um, But it's it's not you know, it's not okay. It ain't okay at all. And it's a lot of it's caused, I think, on purpose. You know, it's it's really, really tricky. <clears throat> it is a tricky thing. And I will say that I don't know if the if the if the wealthiest people meet at Davos every year and then they come back twice as wealthy the next year after they ran a simulation in the event two oh one. Yeah. <laughs> Man, it's hard not to, you know what I'm saying? Like, I don't want to be Mr. Conspiracy, dude, but what people do is they say, I'm a skeptic. And what they really mean is they don't even consider conspiracy. Well, that's the other end of it, right? Some people, all they see is conspiracy. And then some people, there'll be a conspiracy right there and they don't see it, right? Uh -uh. A true skeptic has conspiracy on the table. And if it's not accurate, you sweep it off. If it is accurate, you follow it. Yeah, It's hard to think. As mm -hmm. you know, conspiracy just means it's a secret. And there are sec groups of people that have secrets all over the world. I'm a member of a sorority from college. We have secrets. You know, we have Planning a Planning a surprise answer. birthday party is a conspiracy. What exactly, you exactly. Yeah, come on, don't. So, yeah, right. yeah, yeah. Um, we have another question for you, okay? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> out of these three issues, which one do you have a more of a focus on next year? Human rights? Political rights or economic rights? Economic rights, likely. What I'm trying to develop is something that is uh, is going to reframe what wealth is. We have to change the frame. And with the different change of frame, you make new ideas out of the same data points. But it's going to be economic. That's the short answer. That's important. Yeah, that's great. Um, 
So we, I, here's something I promised you I'd ask at the very end. Um, okay. And we may have more comments, uh, questions coming in. But before we do that, is there anything else that you want to share with everyone? Is there anything we didn't talk about that you'd like to make sure people know? So much, man. Um, I feel like what's most important now is this is what I'm trying to do. So when I say I'm doing this, I'm, 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 I'm doing this failing and getting up doing this failing and getting up, right? And that is um, one of, back when I was a church going person, I ain't no more, but they said, be wise as a serpent and harmless as a dove. The good must take into account the true nature of their opposition and how far they are willing to go. Mm -hmm. And that means that you have to stare into the abyss of the darkness that they have without letting it overcome you. Understand that they, whoever your opposition is, those who would oppose the freedom of the people, have learned their strategies and have been inculcated in the idea that that's the only way, right? But know how far they'll go, up into including murder, genocide, and the whole nine. They'll do it, right? That's scary. Steal yourself <laughs> and figure out your strategy factoring that information in and fight effectively without becoming. And it's that not, is what I'll say. <clears throat> that is not easy. That Hell is no, not easy. Because we have, if let's say you and I are uh, aware of some things happening in the world and we can't even fathom, then it's so hard to go that far because it, I have cognitive dissonance that anybody could, you know, think it's okay to do what's happening to people, you know? So, yeah. so um, I have to, I, I almost have to keep reminding myself, you know, you're, this is a reminder, you know, yeah. that, that, you know, there, there's a lot of things happening that we need to be aware of. There are. Um, yeah. And then I would be remiss to say, when it comes to what's in your power, there's only one thing happening, actually. Uh, there's only one game in town, as one of our mentors told me, and that is the game of personal development through all of this, right? Like yeah, the yeah. raising of your awareness, consciousness, and like your values, integrity, focus, love, compassion, like that's really what's going on, right? And I used to think it was corny when people say, well, if you improve yourself, you make the whole world better. But- Turns out it's true. <laughs> It's true because <laughs> when you do that work, new things become available to you in whatever external fight you're engaged in. Absolutely. And, and those tools would not have been there had you not done the inner work to see uh, through the madness and to the solution. So there's still only one game in town. And that's part of how you do not become the enemy that you are fighting against and realize that they're actually just opposition and a ruthless informant to you. They're just ruthless, <laughs> but there's actually no enemy, but just understand that they could kill you. But also there is no enemy. Both things are true simultaneously. Take the information they're giving you and factor that in. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, um, we are, Theo, we are so honored to have had you on the show, really. Thank you. Really, what a powerful voice for a better world. And um, we, we really appreciate everything you learned and your stories and your life experience. And and um, it's very, I respect you so much. You too, man. Right. Thank you so much. Um, I'm gonna give Alicia the chance to come back in if she wants to. Um, yeah, Alicia, get in and say goodbye. There she is. Thank you guys. I was hesitant because I didn't wanna push the, the tech, the possible tech issues. <laughs> Um, but I did want to say, Theo, thank you very much. Um, you know, no, I, often, you. I often go back and forth with a lot of what you have said and how you have communicated with people, your exchanges, because, you know, as our core value is whatever I do for another, I do for myself, right? right. The same thing is whatever I do to another, I do to myself. And so I look at things like people think I'm crazy. I listen to Rush Limbaugh. You know, I, I yes, watch- you should. News. I do these things because I want to know what people are thinking and feeling and why. And like you've said before, there are times where these things are valid. 
I can't just dismiss it because we have right. uh, political divisions. You know, correct. People have things that are valid that they need to put out there, and we have to we have to respect each other. Right, right, it's a right. Fundamental. Um, so it's always very encouraging for me when I listen to you speaking on these kind of topics. Of you know what, um, we've got some valid points there. Let's sit down. Let's see what we can come up with. Maybe there's some happy medium. Maybe we can meet in the middle on some of these topics. Uh, it's got to start somewhere. I can't just but completely you dismiss you because it's not my thought. It's not how yeah. I was raised. It's not my my uh, experience. You know, absolutely. Um, we, have to, we have to listen to each other, right? We have to listen, even if we're assuming we know what they're saying on the other side. But we have to listen mm -hmm. to find out, and that's what you did so well, Theo. Um, and it's really, mm -hmm. it was it's really heartbreaking that it was so difficult, but maybe that means something as well, right? How difficult it was for you means that these problems are really serious. They're really serious. And I mean, ultimately, um, like when I consider how close I've been to death before, I was like, is it gonna kill you? No, okay, well, <laughs> screw it. What do I got to say? You know what I mean? Like when I contextualize my life like that, you know, um, I wasn't supposed to live past August 15th, 2003. That's when the police handcuffed me to a chair and beat me uh, for putting up more resistance than George Floyd, more resistance than Oscar Grant. Um, so at that point, you know, when you compare it to that, yeah, it seems like uh, we only got limited time anyway, so learn as much as you can. Well, you come across as somebody as a power of example, and I have on multiple occasions pointed people in your direction. You've got to go check out this, this, this talk. You've got to check out, he is speaking here. You've got to go meet with this man. It, it, yeah, because we have to have, we have to have your voice out there as often as possible. I appreciate that. It's so good to find value. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like I said, I'm literally just doing the best I can with, with what I got. So I, I appreciate the appreciation. I mean, I appreciate y'all too. Thank All you. Right. Thank you. Thank yeah. you so much. Both of you, Alicia and Thank Theo. You. Thank you so much. This was a really powerful Thank you, talk. Thank you. For real, for real. Thank y'all so much for having me. Hey.